Welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast, the podcast to help you in your journey towards becoming a wise, empathic, genuine, and connected mental health professional. I'm your host, Dr. David Pewter, a psychiatrist who splits his time practicing psychopharmacology, individual and group psychotherapy, medical director of a day treatment program, medical education research, and teaching residents and medical students. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am joined with Dr. Carolina Osorio, a geriatric psychiatrist. So after she finished her psychiatry residency, she also went on to finish a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry. So today we are going to be talking about a special program that Dr. Mm -hmm. Osorio runs. It treats people with um, depression Mm -hmm. and anxiety who are elderly. So tell me a little bit about the program and maybe a little bit about the passion that led to you starting the program. Sure. Um, So... Basically, when I was a resident, um, I was uh, doing my rotations in the inpatient unit, and we will discharge these patients, and they didn't have any good place to continue follow, following up with their treatments. So that sort of like planted the seed in my head that, you know, there was something more that needed to be done. So when I went to do my fellowship, I sort of like got a new set of lenses that allowed me to see the importance of older adults to get the treatment that they need. And so a general outpatient partial program wouldn't benefit them. And actually sometimes it would make them a little worse because older adults tend to become parents to their younger peers Mm -hmm. in a group. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I came back to Loma Linda, I said, okay, this is the place where I have to be so I can develop this program. And so um, with the support of, you know, the administration here, um, I was able to create my little project, and now we are going on our third year, and it, it just has been really amazing. And um, I can see the benefit from my patients who, at the end of the program, will bring me like poems or cards in, in show of gratitude of how much they improved while they were here. Oh, that's really, that's really wonderful. So it was it was coming from a experiencing kind of a hole in mm-hmm. the psychiatric community, Correct. a hole of like, what do we do with these patients right. when they get discharged from an inpatient psychiatric hospital? They've mm-hmm. been suicidal. They've been severely mm-hmm. anxious. Mm-hmm. And how do we help them move back into life and move back into thriving? Um, so what, what are some unique points of your program mm-hmm. that maybe aren't usual for a partial program, like right. a day treatment program? Right, right. So these, you know, and, um, On another note, these, I don't know of any other program in the Inland Empire. I think there's one other partial um, somewhere here, but this is a very unique, this is a very unique program. Um, Basically, patients will come three times a week. So we know that older adults have a lot of comorbidity. So they get tired easily. They're slower into processing. That's part of normal aging. Uh, but when on top you have depression or anxiety, it becomes even you know more challenging. So we, we our groups are small. We don't want them to be more than eight at a mm-hmm. time, because it takes them a lot of time to process. They a lot of them are going to have hearing impairments, um, and so you know you have to speak loud in these groups. Um, you don't you cannot have a lot of people talking around because they get easily distracted. So the group format. It's a small group. They meet three times a week for three hours. Older adults cannot be here five days a week from nine to three. It's just they are going to be exhausted. Um, And what I did is I basically put together a program where each intervention has evidence base to be effective for the treatment of older adults, depression and anxiety. And I put them together in a bundle because I believe that you need to provide whole patient care. So you are doing therapy. We do CBT. We do problem solving. We do reminiscence therapy. All of them have evidence base that have shown that are effective in older adults. On top of that, we do nutrition education. We do medication education because all those variables will affect the outcomes of the symptoms in this population. Okay, so let's walk through a little one of those components at a time Mm -hmm. maybe and talk about 
you know, how they're useful and, and what you've learned in the process. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's start with um, medications. Right. So what are some of the common medications that people come in on that you try to get off? Mm -hmm. And um, what are medications that you feel are more safe for this population? Yeah. So unfortunately, most of them come on benzodiazepines. Um, they're... Um, you know, a lot of primary cares, they, you know, their their jobs are very busy and they have these really tiny, short appointments. And so when an older adult comes with a mental health complaint, that is put at the bottom of the list. So they address the hypertension, the diabetes, the osteoporosis, and then the later one is it will be the mental health. And so, you know, it's very short time and, you know, they just give them a benzo and you, they go home. And so with time, they become... You know, the body gets used to the benzo, they start increasing the dose, and then they become even more depressed, and then they end in my program. So what I do is I taper them off. Um, a lot of these patients are 20, 30 years on a benzo. So ideally, you want to do this like super, super slow. I have patients that finish the program and they're still on the benzo. Because if you taper them very quickly, they will get delirious. Hmm. And sometimes... You know, you have to use your clinical judgment. Sometimes maybe you need to leave them on a very small dose. But my goal is to reduce the amount and if I can, completely stop it. So that's something I learned from you, like mm -hmm. how slow to go, mm -hmm. especially in the elderly population. So we're talking about, like, let's say they come in on Xanax four milligrams mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. How slow are you going down on that? Right. So I usually, what I do is I convert them to clonopin. Because uh, it's because of the half life, they are going to have less of the withdrawals when you start going down, and then I would probably do like three milligrams of clonopin, and that will take me from six months to a year. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's I think that's really important to emphasize, and um, so if you do taper them off too quickly, mm -hmm. you you said they go into like a delirium. Yeah, they can get delirious. We actually, you know. Um, uh, Dr. Bolton, who's the other geriatrician and inpatient, we see a lot of these. These patients who are uh, tapered too fast, they end in the psych unit, uh, psychotic, but they mm. really are delirious. Mm. And it takes them, you know, we had patients that have been there for a month after they have been taking off the benzos. And so this is, this is like a, an observation that we both, Dr. Bolton and I, we have seen. Okay. And what, so that's one class of medication that you try to get off. Right. Are there any other classes of medications that you try to get off in general? Yeah, absolutely. So any medication with an anticholinergic burden. So, you know, as we age, our brain changes, and there are parts of the brain that are going to um, have a little bit of, you know, synapses are going to decrease, and acetylcholine actually decreases uh, with age. But... If you add a medication that is anticholinergic, you are putting a bigger burden into that normal process. And so then you're going to have the, the, the bad side effects. They're going to get confused. Uh, they're going to have, um, you know, they're going to look sort of like demented. Um, and so you really want to minimize that. So paroxetine, it's a no-no in my practice. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. I said it's very anticholinergic, it's really not good for older adults. Um, so from the antidepressants, that's probably the only one that I can say I definitely don't like to use. The tricyclic antidepressants are also very anticholinergic. The only one that I would use is noritriptyline because it has much, much less of the anticholinergic burden. Yeah, that one, as you increase the dose... Mm -hmm. If you get into a higher dose range, mm -hmm. it does become anticholinergic, mm -hmm. but at the lower right. doses, it's much of a less of a burden. Right. Um, but yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. are, are there okay? So the anticholinergic medications, and what I'll do is I have a list of anticholinergic medications, mm -hmm. an Excel sheet that one of my um, medical students has put together, mm -hmm. um, and we're probably going to do an episode on in the future. But I will put it up on my website and my resource library for you guys if you want to look at all the different medications. What we've done is we've gone through. There's like there's about six different um, really good review articles, and we've put it all in one Excel sheet so you can see in one glance what, what every single different review has thought about in terms of anticholinergic burden of each medication. So we'll put that yeah. up on and, and there's actually the beers list. You can go Google it, mm -hmm. and it's basically uh, this list of medications that are contraindicated in the older adult. So if in doubt, you can always go online, put beers list and then take a look at that. Okay. Any other big, um, early wins mm -hmm. 
and that you can do in, in this population in terms of medications? Right. So the other things is that um, you have to work very closely with your primary care doctors. Um, a lot of primary care doctors, um, do you have primary care doctors who also have a fellowship on geriatrics, but most of the primary care do not have this specialized training. So sometimes you want to guide them into medications. I don't want to make that decision because, first of all, I didn't start the medication. Second, I am not their primary care. So what I do is I collaborate with them. Oh. So there are medications that, um, you know, we are getting more and more information that are not good for long term uh, for many reasons. So I'm not only thinking about the brain, but I'm also thinking about the whole body in general. So sometimes they, I have a case of a patient who came with a diagnosis of depression. So when I started treating her, I noted that her heart rate was ranging between 50 and 55, and she was on metoprolol. So, you know, I said, you know, what about if we first look at your medical side and see if we do some changes, your, your mood is going to improve. And so I communicated with the primary care. The primary care cut the metoprolol to half, heart rate went up, patients started feeling better. So, you know, there are a lot of medical problems that are confounding and they can present like depression. Mm. So being very aware of these and knowledgeable of other medical problems and their medications is extremely important in geriatrics. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one thing um, I, I've learned from you also is you always measure blood pressure and mm -hmm. heart rate mm -hmm. in your outpatient clinic and yes. all your patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you went out and you bought like an... Yes. You know, <laughs> electric, electronic blood pressure cuff. Right, yeah. To make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I have, you know, I have patients that I have sent to urgent care and they end with a pacemaker just because I'm taking vitals in my office. Yeah, and I think that's, um, that's a good pearl as well. <laughs> um, okay, so, so we talked about the benzodiazepines, the anticholinergic medications, looking at all the other medications. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot of nuance and this is probably why... Mm -hmm. You know, you really study this stuff. Are there, um, is, are there any stories that pop into your mind? Maybe you could change a couple of the details, but mm -hmm. like of big wins that just came from decreasing, mm -hmm. you know, any of these medications. Um, like psychiatry medications or in everything? Everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there is a big movement um, on Twitter. It's called deprescribing. And so it's like all these doctors that are coming together to, uh, you know, make an emphasis on de-prescribing medications. Mm -hmm. A lot of older adults, when you start decreasing meds, they start feeling better. So they were just depressed because no, it was not like an, a major depressive disorder. It was a side effect from medications. And that really is the first thing you want to think when you have a new patient and you see a very large list of medications that they're taking. Um, so, for example, last week I was in SAC clinic with one of our residents, and we had a new patient, 70-year-old lady, super mm -hmm. sweet. Um, she came by herself, but she's one of these very complex patients because she has insulin-dependent diabetes, she has kidney problems, and so she has a care, care manager from primary care. Later on, the, prim the care manager came to make sure that um, she was going to know what our recommendations were. Anyways, we did the psych evaluation. And then when we went into the chart and we look at the labs, she had had blood drawn a week before we saw her. Um, and when I saw those lab results, they were completely abnormal. Now, when she came to the visit, she was a little confused. She thought that she was there for a diabetes checkup. Um, and she didn't know a lot of like uh, the was not clear about the date, and she will have difficulty finding words. And she was complaining of depression, and she would say, if the good old Lord takes me, I am ready to go. I feel like life is, you know, I have reached my ultimatum, and I don't want to live any longer. She was not having a uh, thoughts about hurting herself, though. But what, what, why I'm bringing this up is because people, older adults who are delirium, 37% will present with suicidal ideation mm. or passive wishes of death. Yeah. So when you see an older adult who is depressed, don't think immediately is depression. Anyways, we went to look at their med list, potassium 6.1. So I have this walking lady with a 6.1 of potassium. So I start to get worried. And so the care manager said, yeah, they drew the blood last week. They told her to go to urgent care. And the patient said, yes, but I forgot. So 
Um, immediately, we did an AKG, and her two ways were picked, so we had to send her to the ER. We call AMR, and she's now admitted here at Loma Linda. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, when I see an older person who is a little bit confused and depressed, my first thing is a medical thing. Yeah, I, I just saw this just a couple of weeks ago, mm. got referred to patient, depression, anxiety, and the more I, I took the history, it coincided with infections, with falls, yeah. with surgeries, right. and the timing was just laid out perfectly like that, mm -hmm. you know. And so the first thing I did was not, you know, an antidepressant, was not therapy. Correct. It was like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get you off of these medications, mm -hmm. and you know, incredibly high anxiety about yeah. it, you know. And also, you know, you have to write down the directions. You have right, to right. involve family mm -hmm. members sometimes. I've, well, yeah, I mean. I know that many times when you train in psychiatry, they will tell you, uh, don't bring family. M in a geriatric mentality, I want to bring family as much as I can because mm -hmm. they really need that support. Yeah. Okay, so we, you're, this is the first line. You, you go through their medications. You make sure they're not having side effects of medications. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're in the, the treatment mm -hmm. therapy, mm -hmm. the milieu, uh, group therapy, and they're getting pieces of different... Um, therapy. Now you, you talked about problem solving therapy. Yeah, yeah there's problem solving therapy um, in which, you know, uh, when they are depressed or anxious, they have a problem, right? And that problem is just a uh, hundred times worse. But some of these problems are, most of these problems are real. So you want to understand that older adults are going to have increased amounts of, of worrying about falling, and falling is a big problem in geriatrics, right? Because once you fall, you break your bone. We know people within a year can die from that. So it is a valid concern, but they will sort of like magnify it. So problem solve therapy is a way of teaching them how to um, find ways to solve that particular problem that they're worrying about. Sometimes you cannot solve the problem per se, but the process of doing that um, gives them different options that they can pick at if the worrying starts coming again. So give me a little like piece, like, like let's say a patient was listening to this or, you know, mm -hmm. a provider who's struggling, mm -hmm. who wants to use this type of therapy. Like what are some simple steps that you take people through? Right. So let's say you have an older lady. Um, so I'm going to give you this case. I have a patient right now that she came severe, she has a, like a very, very bad anxiety. She's constantly shaking. She was in the hospital for about three weeks and she's depressed. So unfortunately, while she's attending my program, she falls at home and breaks her arm, right? So now she's in complete despair because everything is falling apart. She doesn't get better. And now she broke her arm. And so it put her in, in a situation of, like I said, despair. Um, she feels guilty because she cannot help family cleaning the house and, um, she feels she's a burden to them. So I told her, okay, we have, we have a problem. You broke your arm, right? And she's like, yes. And I said, okay, if you worry, can you solve that problem? And she said, no. And then she even said, it can make it worse. And, and so we started to go, okay, so if you have a broken arm and you cannot help fixing the house, Let's go through different things that you can do while your arm is healing. And so you make them think and you make them come with the solutions. And so you start telling them, let's think of any solution. It might be a possible solution or an impossible solution, but let's just make a list. So you start with this huge list. Mm -hmm. And then that list, you divide it in two. You divide it, okay, this possibility is definitely possible. But these three here, they are possible. So I want you to pick one of these solutions and I want you to start implementing it at home. And so that's how you do problem solving with that. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I like that. And that's a simple, it's a simple win, right? It's a simple and, win. and so often, um, although we're, you know, intelligent human beings, mm -hmm. we run into a problem and we mm -hmm. just kind of freeze. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think th it's just good to, to make one step forward right. to find one potential solution. Yeah. Okay, that's really good. Um, and you also mentioned reminiscence mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. So talk talk me through how you do that. Yeah, reminiscence therapy really is one of my favorites. Um, and the reason why, so one of the things I love working with older adults is that I learn so much from them. 
they have a frame of reference that is completely different than ours. Um, some of them, I have a few patients who were, uh, you know, were living during World War II. Um, and so I have, my favorite ones are old African-American ladies who truly lived segregation time. Um, I had one that uh, she told me when she was a little kid, she will pick the cotton in these big, you know, plantations or, or fields uh, that white people would have. And she said, you know, even though I had all these limitations and I was a black woman, I knew the power of education. And I knew that if I educated myself, um, I could have a voice. And this lady put herself through school and she became a nurse practitioner. Incredible. Amazing, amazing. So I've been working with her for about three years. She now has dementia and she has advanced pretty um, severely. So um, she's now total care from her family. But, you know, this is, is an amazing experience as a provider is to hear all these stories. So in reminiscence therapy, you're... So in reminiscence therapy, what you do is you go, you, you reminiscence on the good things. Okay. And so, for example, you will show them like a picture of a turkey, right? Yeah. If you're in a group. Yeah, yeah. And then you start sell- telling them, okay, what does this remind you of? And everybody starts lighting up and they start talking about Thanksgiving with their families. And, you know, and, they, and then you talk about what, you, what, what is your member? What is the smell? And you go through the senses. Mm. And that is start to, you know, fire up uh, the, uh, the, the positive emotions in your brain. And so um, you, do, you can also do reminiscence therapy even in patients who have dementia because patients with dementia, their long-term memory is pretty solid. So, you know, they go into the past and they start brightening up and it's, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. Mm. That's really good because I know there, it's likely that some um, people will be listening who have parents with dementia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And who have friends with dementia. Mm-hmm. And so what you're saying is, Try to use pictures, yes, use imagery. Absolutely. Yeah. So they love pictures because, mm-hmm. you know, they, they are not like us. Our, our pictures are in a phone, right? They like the print, paper, uh, photo albums. So yeah. what I yeah, tell yeah. always to my family members is go, if you have pictures, print all of those pictures mm. and start creating photo albums with your loved one who has dementia. Um, And that is really something that they can do together as a family and it helps the patient tremendously. I think that's, I think that is another great win. Um, I was, I'm working with residents on psychotherapy Mm -hmm. and one of the residents, um, just a real gentle soul. uh, And he had a patient bring in their photo album of their deceased loved one. And it was just yesterday and we were just going through Mm -hmm. page by page Mm -hmm. And listening to her um, brag and, you know, Absol- that uh, you're rejoice. Doing, you are doing reminiscence therapy right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's it's sometimes just focusing on the positive, focusing mm-hmm. on the strengths mm-hmm. in, the, in that group mm-hmm. you find really helpful. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but the importance of that is bringing memories that have a positive emotion. So even when people are demented and they're like on their late end stages, they might not remember your face, but they will emotionally remember who you are and they will react to you emotionally. That's really helpful because, um, yeah, one of my mentors, who I'll probably have on in the future, uh, his wife had dementia. Mm-hmm. And he would visit her and he, she wouldn't remember his name. But when he walked in the room, she would brighten up a little yeah, bit. Exactly. And um, she would express needs that she had. Mm-hmm. You know, and some of them were simple needs, like, I really need some food today, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And um, so there was this kind of, like, connection that's still possible, but it's it can be hard, of course, Mm -hmm. as a caregiver. Yeah, no, I mean, I am telling you this, and it's easy for me. And actually, when I talk to my families, I tell them, what I'm going to tell you comes very easy to me, but I know that it's going to be extremely hard for you to do. So I warn them, because... You know, you're going to say, oh, you need to do this, 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 and that. And this is how you communicate with them. But we don't have that emotional connection. And when that happens, I always say, you know, I don't know if my husband or my mom or whoever, I don't know if I'm going to be able to know how to manage. Even though I'm the expert, when it comes to your family, it's a completely different story. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And also, you know, you don't always have only positive experiences with your parent. Exactly. And now when they develop, mm -hmm. you know, dementia, if they mm -hmm. do develop dementia, it's like all of a sudden you, you have this like mm -hmm. mixture of emotions uh, yeah. and, um, and that can be, that can complicate things as yes. well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And you also talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. So what is the behavioral aspect that you recommend? So we do behavioral activation, right? So, um, they have a hard time scheduling routines. And so what we do here is we help them scheduling those routines and we help them accountable because you have to break the cycle, right? You're depressed. You mm -hmm. want to be in bed, you yeah. stay in bed, you get more depressed. Yeah. So you first you do education on this process. And then you start helping them find ways in which they can break that routine. So maybe that is going on Sunday to visit your grandkids. So one simple thing that that Sunday is going to break this cycle. So instead of you being in bed all Sunday, you're going to go visit your grandkids. So you have some sort of worksheet, calendar mm -hmm. of the week, mm -hmm. and you have them think through what are the activities mm -hmm. that give them a sense of meaning, right? that give them... Uh, a sense of pleasure, right? And how do I schedule these activities mm -hmm. into my day, right? And and so what you do is you tell them, I want you to choose an activity, not something that you have to do, but something that you want to do. Because there is a big difference. Like for example, um, I have dogs, right? And I love them. And so, well, I have to bathe my dog, but it's something that I have to do. Uh, do I really want to bathe my dog? Like, is it pleasure? Is, is it relaxing? No. So what is something that I want to do, not that I have to do? Mm. And you have to be very, very strong making that difference. With some patients with behavioral activation, if you get really depressed, you're um, less likely to enjoy anything. Absolutely. And so I always ask patients when I'm looking at these activities and what do you want to do? Or maybe it's a what did you want to do before you were depressed? Um, because then it's like, if they're completely anhedonic, you know, they have no mm -hmm. pleasure in anything, mm -hmm. then hopefully by doing the things that they enjoyed in the past, it can help pull them out of the depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, uh, okay, so any other tips on behavioral therapy? Do you schedule, do you recommend any types of exercise to them? Yes, I, I always, always. Um, we know... Um, so the evidence for brain health is physical activity, socialization, nutrition, and stress management. So, uh, so the second one, being with friends and family, yes. that can help the brain as so, well? Yeah. yeah, because if, I mean, if you imagine like just you and me sitting here talking, our brains are firing up. You are using, you're using visual spatial, you're using your, your social skills, you're using your cognition, you're using so many different areas of the brain, and, but we take it for granted. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first one's exercise. Yeah, exercise. So the number one exercise that I always recommend is Tai Chi. Hmm. And the reason why is because there is a big burden of evidence that shows that Tai Chi decreases the risk of falls in older adults by 85%. Oh. There, actually, there are insurances that are starting to pay for Tai Chi for older adults because it's cheaper to do that than to fix a, a broken hip. Much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, my one to go is Tai Chi. It's very easy. It's very smooth. Pretty much anyone can do it. Now, if you are wheelchair bound, then my recommendation is to do chair exercises. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, like the Drayson here. They have chair exercises for older adults. Um, Where they're moving their arms. Yes, they're moving their arms, their torso, their necks. Yeah. And sometimes um, you can move the leg. I mean, maybe you cannot walk because you're very um, uh, debilitated. Weak. Yeah. Sarcopenia. Yes, <laughs> yes. But you can lift the legs from your knees up and down, right? So you're sitting on a chair, and then you just extend and flex your knee. Okay. And then sometimes when they are doing this really well, you can put weights. Weights is, is a, it's very important because when you do weights, your muscles are contracting and you're impacting those bones. So that is a good mm -hmm. way to decrease osteoporosis. Any um, types of weightlifting exercise you would recommend in particular, Dr. Osorio, that have helped, been helpful for you? <laughs> well, I um, great, receive great benefit of weightlifting thanks to your team. How, how's it going? Well, it's on hold for now. We got it. We got to yeah, go back. Get back. Yeah. We got to get you a home gym. Yeah. That's where it's at. <laughs> when, you're, when you're a busy provider, uh, sometimes a home gym will work. Yeah. Will work. But I would say um, 
the the hack that I've found, or like mm-hmm. the the, sh- the thing that's the most important, is to have people come to your home gym. I know, yeah. Three times a week to lift with you, and they could be people you're teaching or people that mm-hmm. are teaching you. But that for me is the most important accountability. Because I have people who show up to my house. I don't text them. Mm. I have six. I had six people in my home gym just this last Sunday night, and it was like, mm. you know, I can't not lift right because mm. they're there. Exactly. So, yeah. okay. So yeah, so weightlifting. So weightlifting is so important. Is very important. Yeah, and um, and everybody can do it, in regardless of the age. You just need to have someone that is has the expertise to help you and guide you through. With with the elderly, muscles can get stronger. Yes, strength can increase. You can increase strength. Now, so there is the, this is the thing very important. Um, when as normally everyone we are going to develop some degree of sarcopenia as we age mm-hmm. but if you start doing weightlifting from young age so let's say you have um 100 muscle cells and you bump that by exercising to 200 so when you start developing sarcopenia as you get old then you're going to go down from 200 to 100 so you still are going to be pretty fit and strong compared to a person who never worked out. And in my earlier episode on, um, I did one on exercise and cognitive function, mm-hmm. talk about how exercise in the elderly uh, pretty much halted mm-hmm. the dementia type of process. Mm-hmm. Just exercise. So, I mean, we're talking about multiple domains that can be helpful, mm-hmm. but just exercise alone, just um, specifically weight training, because it mm-hmm. helps the right. bones, yeah. it helps the mm-hmm. the it helps decrease falls. Right. Um, you know, when you're stronger, you're less likely to fall. And I, I think especially I'm a proponent of free weights mm-hmm. and learning how to squat with, with a bar, you know, mm-hmm. without like, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of machines around you because that teaches you the balance mm-hmm. as you progress in the weights, you know. And a lot of a lot of the patients that I see mm-hmm. in my clinic, I have them squat just out of their chair. Mm-hmm. And if they can't squat out of their chair, I get them bands mm-hmm. that they can attach right, right. to a door or to the ceiling at a specific chair of their house so that they can use the bands to help them squat out of a chair. Mm-hmm. And if they do like three sets of five and then two days later, they can use a little bit less band or a mm-hmm. little bit less help. And then they can slowly get to a place where they can air squat. And when they can air squat, maybe they can eventually squat deeper and then they can add um, a little bit of weight. You know, mm-hmm. I just hold a, a a gallon of milk, Mm -hmm. you know, and squat with that. And then, you know, get to a gym and get, get some free weights. Okay. But so you involve, you talk to your patients about this. Mm -hmm. What, how many, how do you get your patients to actually follow through with exercise? It's very difficult. Um, the, so I'm talking about a population of older adults that are pretty sick and they're fragile and they have a lot of social restraints. Um, so this is the population I work here. Um, in, 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 in Loma Linda. So it's very difficult for many, many different reasons. Um, because the Tai Chi has proven to be so effective, there is um, senior centers now offering Tai Chi. Um, I think that Drayson did offer it, but uh, they, they had a grant for that and they don't have any more money for that. And so really, you know, we need to start work within the communities in creating or uh, making uh, communities that are aging friendly. We don't have that. And that's mm. a huge problem. Yeah. Okay. So the first component you said to brain health was exercise. Second was... Nutrition. Um, social, socializing. or socializing. Yeah, And then nutrition, yeah. the, the third one you yeah. mentioned. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about nutrition. What mm-hmm. changes mm-hmm. Um, do you most advocate? If you were to make one change, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I'm going to go back to this thing about the physical exercise. So... Geriatric population is very diverse, right? You can have a 60-year-old who literally is going to drop dead any time because of so many problems. And you can have a 90-year-old who's pretty healthy. Mm-hmm. So you have to really be doing clinical judgment in terms of these exercises that you're going to recommend. But my first thing that I do is I ask them about their balance. If they tell me, oh, I sometimes lose my balance or I feel like my legs are weak, I immediately put a referral for a PT. Okay. So even though you're a psychiatrist, don't think that, oh, I'm just going to do medication or whatever. I'm mental health. I'm just going to do therapy. No. Think about balance. Think about gait. And if there's any concern whatsoever, put a referral for PT. I have put many referrals and I have never had a problem with that. 
Hmm. So that is another very important topic. Yeah. So sometimes as a psychiatrist, we're like the main coach, right? And we're guiding mm -hmm. treatment. We're looking for what's the biggest win. And mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, if they have balance, the biggest mm -hmm. win that they can have is just mm -hmm. not to fall. Exactly. Because if you fall, you end mm -hmm. up in the hospital, you end mm -hmm. up with a hip fracture, you end up with worse mm -hmm. delirium or delirium. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's a good pearl. Yeah. So the next one is socialization. Socialization. Okay. Yeah. So it's very important. Uh, the Framingham study showed that the higher risk factor for morbidity and mortality was isolation. Isolation is toxic for our brains. And what happened in the United States with these communities that are so poorly age equipped? Mm -hmm. They isolate, right? They're isolate. homeless. Absolutely, right? yeah. And so they isolate and then they will die faster. Mm -hmm. So um, socialization is very important. It doesn't mean that you have to be or have tons of friends. It yeah. can be just one person. The importance is the level of trust and vulnerability that you can have with that person. And so that's where the difference is. This is huge, yeah. I, I Connection is, is necessary throughout all of life, mm -hmm. right? And to have a couple close connected friends makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what we do, what I do with the residents, if they're, if they're older and they're having issues making friends is, you know, create some behavioral activation to get them to places where there's the potential of friends, mm -hmm. you know? So for some people it's like, okay, you used to go to church 30 years, you know, mm -hmm, now right. you, you can't drive. Um, you might do some, the problem solving therapy to yeah, think through exactly. how to get to church mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. can have those connections or, um, yeah, I don't know if you have any other. No, yeah, that's, that uh, that's, that's accurate. So, you know, um, that is one of the big barriers. Transportation is huge. Um, and because we lack of the transportation, then these patients cannot go where they used to do. And they start losing relationship with friends. And, and then maybe they cannot even visit their grandkids. And you know for a grandparent not to be able to see their grandkids is really not a good thing. Yeah. Okay, so the second, uh, so this socialization, and then mm -hmm. the third one was diet. So right, so nutrition. So... I personally, what I recommend everyone is the Mediterranean diet. And the reasons are v various. Number one, if you, we know that plant-based is really the goal outstanding best way to, to, to nourish your body. But most people were not born or raised in a plant-based family. And food is highly, highly related with culture and upbringing. So it's going to be very difficult for an older person to go vegan when they were raised on eating, you know, animal products. So the Mediterranean diet is a diet that can consist of grains, lots of fish, olive oil, avocado, fruits, and vegetables. This year, it came up as the number one diet recommended by um, the medical field. And so there was a study done where they combined Mediterranean diet with a DASH diet, which is the diet with low sodium for hypertension. And they did two groups. One group was people with mild cognitive impairment, and they followed the Mediterranean DASH diet. The other group had mild cognitive impairment, but they just continue eating whatever they eat. The group who did the intervention did not convert it to dementia, and while the other group, they had a higher conversion rate. So we know that this is effective and there's evidence for that. Yeah. So I did um, one of my prior episodes, I actually talk about cognitive issues and diet. And specifically when you're looking at the Mediterranean diet, I wonder if the, you know, you have a high omega threes yeah. in the mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. um, you have high poly and monosaturated mm -hmm. fats in the olive oil, mm -hmm. in the nuts, and then, you know, you don't have a lot of sugary products. No. So you have low, you know, high fructose corn syrup. Oh, yeah. You're that's not having a lot of added terrible. sugar. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of plants, you know, so you're having lots of mm -hmm. salads. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we try to do a lot of salads, a lot of mm -hmm. um, a lot of those, those nuts and Fruits, salmon yeah. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, any other... Uh, thoughts on diet that you would want to put out there as like, you know, a quick win that someone can have a single, maybe a one change. Like if they were to make one change to their diet, what would you usually tell someone? Stop processed, processed foods. Processed foods. Just stop that. 
Yeah. So what is like an example of so like, like uh, bread, food? cookies, cakes, um, dinner, TV dinner, food, uh, <laughs> anything that you can microwave, it is a processed food. Yeah. 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 You, so what you want to do is you want to use whole products, products from the earth, <sighs> right? So things that you can grow, um, things that are, you know, we're all interconnected. You know, our bodies are connected to nature. And, you know, we have all these things that are very good for your body, but we don't use them because we live in such a fast-paced society. Things have to be now, now, now. Mm -hmm. And so you don't spend the time on, you know, cutting your vegetables or cooking. And, 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 and that ha I mean, that's what we call the standard American diet, the sad diet. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible diet. It makes people sick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you mention there was another brain health recommendation as well? Was so there a fourth one? Yeah. Oh, um, stress reduction. Stress reduction. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so stress reduction, well, give me your short on how do we reduce I mean, stress? Uh, there's so many things you can do. I mean, mindfulness, visualization. And so um, there is this concept of something called precision medicine, which is basically you do your assessment in very, very detail. You even like even do like a personality test. And so basically, when you know your patient fully in detail, then you can start matching that person to different um, ways that you can do to promote health. Okay. So let's say you, so you're a vegetarian. So you know you can talk about plant-based food. Now, I, you're not a vegetarian. I'm not going to talk to you about that because I know that is not going to be sustainable for you. You might be able to do it for a month, but you're not going to be able to do it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, uh, um, stress, stress reduction, reduction, there is a lot of exercises. There are people who are very resistant to do meditation. So you don't want to talk to them about meditation. Maybe what they like to do is swimming in a pool. So you encourage them to put that as a routine. And to do stress reduction is not you're going to do this when you get stressed out. No, you're going to do this every day. You're going to master that. Mm. Because when in case you get an episode of stress, you already can nail that down. But if you do it only as needed, that's not going to work. Okay. Yeah. So you're when you think stress reduction, you mentioned exercise. Exercise. Meditation. Meditation. Healthy diet. Healthy diet. Um, visualization. Body scanning. Um, you know, aromatherapy. I myself, I use aromatherapy. I really feel it, it you know, using your senses yeah, yeah. to calm down your sympathetic responses. Right, right. Yeah, we should, next time we do an episode, we'll yes. have a little aromatherapy going in here. We'll <laughs> put a little lavender. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what's your favorite orange. scent? You like orange? Uh, it's energizing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> do you need more of that? Um, okay, well, kind of bringing this to a to a close. So... Um, so we're just talking about prevention here. We're talking about prevention, yeah. but we also talked about your program. Right. We talked yeah. about things that you've learned about medications, mm -hmm. getting people off medications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Are there any other big wins that you would like to share to someone who's a, who's a provider? Mm -hmm. Something that they, sh maybe the biggest um, pet peeve that you have mm -hmm. that other providers who are not geriatricians mm -hmm. do? On terms of medications? So um, I, I will give you this little pearl. Um, we have a couple of studies that have talked about serotonin um, in older depressed patients um, and how that can um, uh, delay the progression of a mild cognitive impairment into Alzheimer's. So this study showed that SSRIs are the best medication. There's actually a study that they did with older adults who had mild cognitive impairment and they had a history of depression um, and so those who were taking SSRIs, it delayed progression of the mild cognitive impairment by three years. Mm. But those patients who were put on another type of antidepressant, actually the progression was faster. Which type of antidepressant was well, faster? Well, butrin, SNRIs, tricyclics. Okay. Anyone that is not an SSRI specifically. Wow. Yeah. So I always go first with an SSRI. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that people don't think about is lithium. Mm. Lithium is it, it's brain protective. Mm. It um, does a lot of things for the brain that are very healthy, and it actually produces neurogenesis. So, if you have a patient on an SSRI and they might not be doing great, they're partially responding. I add a little tiny dose of lithium, okay, because I know that is going to help that brain. By tiny dose, you mean? 
like um, may, no more than 600, 150, 300. Or and you, you don't 300. care about brain or um, blood levels? That doesn't no, matter. No, I, I do. I, I check the blood levels because, okay. you know, older adults, you know, the problem with them is that when you get older, you lose the sense of thirst. So they are at higher risk of dehydration. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I do check blood levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a nice pearl. What What is your go-to for aggression? Like, let's say you have an elderly patient who's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, becoming aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, what is... For depression, treating depression? Uh, or aggression? Aggression, you know, they may be... I, I guess there's a lot of reasons why people can get exactly. aggressive. Exactly. So you, you need to understand why are the patient aggressive? Are, is it they're depressed? Is it yeah. they're delirious? Yes. Is are they it their frontal lobe, right. dementia? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. So let's say they are frontal lobe dementia. Mm -hmm. What's your go-to treatment? I mean, I, I usually put everybody on an SSRI. Um, there is a study called the citalopram Alzheimer's disease. Citalopram is very good for behavioral problems. Um, but S, S citalopram. Lexapro? No, Celexa. Celexa, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a good one. The problem is that this FDA came with this warning about the QTC, whatever. So that will be a completely different topic. But so you go in, look into the meds, you see how many of those can prolong QTC. You do an AKG if you need to. Not everybody needs a Q uh, an AKG, but I really like Celexa. And then if it's a frontal, it's a disinhibition, I definitely go for Depakote. That's, you know... It's a very good medication for frontal problems. Okay. Dr. Sorio, one other thing you need to know about Dr. Sorio is mm -hmm. the residents love Dr. Sorio. Oh. They really do. Like we had this we had this day where people, we'd put up a, a face of the different attendings mm -hmm. and people could text up anonymously mm -hmm. thoughts that they had on the attendings. Mm -hmm. And we used this, we used an approach only once because uh, it got a little rowdy. <laughs> but for you, it was like just an onslaught of positive comments. Mm. People love Dr. Soria. People love being mentored by you. They feel a maternal warmth, oh. uh, a kindness. The, you know, people aspire to be an attending like Dr. Osorio. So um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for your invitation. This is an honor to be here. It's well, We're going to have you back. If you have any questions about the episode, feel free to email me at dr at psychiatrypodcast.com. Um, I will put a link in the show notes and on my website to the Wisdom Program. Yeah, That's Dr. Soria's program. Yeah. And um, if you're in the LA area, I think it would be reasonable to mm -hmm. commute out to go to that program. Absolutely. Um, it is pretty full normally. Is there a wait list at this point? Or? I don't have a wait list. It, it very fluctuates. It but, fluctuates, yeah. But know that there is a resource for your patients. Know that this group is highly effective because it also fights isolation. It makes them socialize. Yeah. And it, it is, it's not because it's mine, but it's definitely a wonderful program. Um, and the patients, when they leave, they are just absolutely happy with their results. Um, there is a lot of stigma in older adults, and they don't want to be perceived as a mental patient. So work in your relationship. And once you build a trust and report, send them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing um, when I have other providers talk to me, oh, yeah, I, I told so and so about the program. You know, they, de they definitely mm -hmm. didn't follow through. You know, maybe on the fifth or sixth time. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, okay, maybe there is right. something don't give here. Up, yeah. mm -hmm. So don't give up. Um, keep referring to a program that's going to be helpful, whatever that is. And, um, and, and don't stop talking about things that are mm -hmm. going to be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. Exercise, diet, sleep. We didn't even talk about sleep. Oh, we sleep. didn't. Oh, yeah. People well, who don't sleep have higher risk for dementia. It's a terrible thing. Well, we'll, um, well so many we're, topics. We're going to have to have a, a, a second episode, Dr. Soria. So thanks for coming on. If you want CME for this episode, um, you can follow the website to, the, um, to get CME for it. Uh, if you're a provider, if you're mm -hmm. a nurse practitioner, a nurse Recently had a nurse submit um, the CME and got mm -hmm. CME for it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Dr. Soria, thank you so thank much. You. Mm -hmm. And My we pleasure. will um, have part two. If you have any questions that you want answered in part two by Dr. Osorio, mm -hmm. feel free to um, shoot me a message through my social media, Instagram, Facebook, or um, through my email or through the website. There's lots of different ways. And I usually compile those for future episodes. So... Thank you, Dr. Sorry. Absolutely.